guys uh, Seinfeld or Friends fans back in the back in the day. Uh, I have been binge watching some TV shows recently, and Friends should be high uh, high on that list. And we've been in a conversation kind of like that, uh, where we're talking to somebody, and it feels like we're beating ourselves up, like, like we're be banging our heads against the wall, uh, that we're arguing something, and you're like, you are just so wrong, but they're so convinced they're right, and we, we get to the end, and we maybe throw around that word, how arrogant of a person to not even think that there might be another solution uh, to whatever the conversation uh, might be. We challenged Wellspring last week uh, when we looked at God's Word uh, to read through the Gospel of John. Uh, we challenged you guys to maybe take three chapters a day and work your way through it. So on the, on the first day, you would have read John chapter 3. There's an arrogant, arrogant statement that's made in there. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus, and then, and then we have the verse that we looked at last week, John 3, 16, and then we fast forward just a little bit, and, and John the Baptist is speaking, someone that was declaring the name of Jesus and going before him, and, and he, he says this in John 3, 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. Claims and, and statements like that are made throughout the Gospel of John. How, how uncomfortable a thought that if, if, if I don't reckon myself with Jesus, that the wrath of God would remain on me. Are we quick in an uncomfortable situation, an uncomfortable setting? An uncomfortable conversation. To throw things off as arrogant. Does that sound perhaps, if we don't take that for, to be true, that, that it would be easy for us to, to say that's such an arrogant statement. And so we say there are no absolutes. <laughs> and that all roads can, can lead to God to, to perhaps bring us a level of comfort. When we surveyed the community, asking why they don't like the church, why they hate the church, why they hate God, here's, here's three statements that were made. One person said, I definitely, definitely believe in a higher power. I just don't believe Christianity is the only religious option that is correct. There are too many similarities in religious stories, practices, etc. to think that only one religious interpretation is correct. Another person said, because if there is one chosen religion then most people are going to hell. If Jews are the chosen people, then all non-Jews are going to hell. If Christians are the chosen people, then all, all, all non-Christians are going to hell. The all-loving God who will punish you for not believing correctly, please. Third person said, there are 4,200 religions in the world, and everyone thinks that their religion is right. Why would we make such statements like that? What, what is it about all roads lead to God? Is it, is it perhaps sometimes that those types of statements are made for our own comfort? When we've thought about our, our life, and I'm, I'm a decently good person. I see what's happening on the news. I'm not that doctor in Michigan. So, so when I think about the afterlife, I, I'll just flippantly say, well, all roads lead to God. I will be okay. Or maybe we think so much about the afterlife. And when we think about our cousin, our, our daughter, our son, our, our father, or, or some family figure, or perhaps even our own selves, when we think about the afterlife, we put so much thought into it that, that we can't rationalize on the other side of the spectrum that the, a well-meaning person wouldn't end up in eternity. How could that be? And so I, again, I, I ask ourselves, is it, is it a level of our own comfort that brings us to a place of saying all roads must lead to God. And usually that is based on the fact that I'm a good person and God would never turn his back on me. I've not gone to jail, but I had a season of drinking. I got into a car when I shouldn't have. By the grace of God, I didn't kill anybody. I've texted while driving. By the grace of God, I haven't killed somebody. 
So, so is heaven only for people that haven't gotten caught? <laughs> or is it for people that have said yes to Jesus? <laughs> And so we, we want to pick up a, a scene where, where Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He was rolling 12 deep. He had 12 disciples. And, and he, he, there's a, in, their, they're in the midst of a very uncomfortable situation, he says this in John 14, verse 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Believe, uh, believe in God. Believe also in me. So in John 13, here's the uncomfortable situation. The disciples are having a meal with Jesus. They've been, they've been hanging out with him for three years, doing life with Jesus, every waking moment with Jesus. It was awesome. They saw incredible things happen. And they, and they get to the point where they're having dinner with Jesus, the, their God, their Messiah, the, the, the person that they love. And he says, I'm going to die and suffer. Everything's about to be turned upside down. The man, the, the, the person of, of your affection is saying, I am going to die. And Peter, bold Peter, is like, no, Jesus, I'll die for you. No, 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 no. He washes their feet to show them love. He says, love others as I have loved you. And, and now we turn the page to John 14. He, he senses the uncomfortable situation, the discomfort in the room. And he says, here's, here's the fix to the uncomfortable situation. Believe. Believe in me. He commands them, don't be troubled. Belief will bring a lack of that troubling feeling. So when it comes to the, to the afterlife, and it, it, do we have a sense of discomfort? Perhaps belief would be that thing, that, that, that element that would bring us a level of comfort because Jesus is telling them, I, I'm going to leave. And he's talking about eternal uh, ramifications, eternal aspects and he says, believe in me. You can have faith in me. You can find comfort in my death, in my resurrection. And, and as they're looking at Jesus, as, they, as they're seeing him as king, like, they have to ask themselves, Jesus, what about your death is going to bring me comfort? How on earth? Like, we, we look at you as a conquering king. What on earth are you going to conquer in death? Every other hero has died, and when they died, they really accomplished very little. So what are you going to accomplish as a conquering king that dies? Away to God. Because if we see God as all-powerful, we've talked about God and, and fairy tale and things of those things, listen to a sermon or two ago. If we can wrap our minds around God being all-powerful, doesn't he have to be more powerful than death? Doesn't he have to be? And so he dies and says, I'm going to do what every hero before me hasn't done. I'm going to prove to be more powerful than death so I can do one main thing. Offer you life. No one else can offer you life. No one else has lived as a perfect person, as a sacrifice for our, our sin and our bad behavior. Only I who have li has lived perfectly and only I who is going to die and then rise from the grave, conquering death, through my death and resurrection, I offer you life. And I ask that in the midst of this uncomfortable setting, that you might believe in me. I had a, a situation, I've, I've mentioned this before, a little bit about my story, where I went to a Bible school and, uh, and didn't do so hot there, and uh, had a time after Bible school where I had to uh, kind of get some things right with God, so I moved down from Virginia to Virginia, I partied and girls, and you would think that that was like the rock star lifestyle, that it's really cool, really awesome, but discomfort, a lack of comfort, like it was, like it was a miserable season in my life, a lot of tears, and it was awful until I met Ava, and everything turned around because she's my beautiful wife, and, uh, but in, in the midst of that, I had this person yell at me and say, you could ace any Bible test in the world, but you don't believe any of it. And it was really at that moment where I was like, yeah, my, my lifestyle right now isn't that comfortable. <laughs> my lifestyle doesn't prove that I believe what I know to be true. And it was in that moment that God just got a hold of me, and I radically changed things around. And in doing that, I found life to be a whole lot more comfortable. 
as I started giving it over to Jesus, as I started making tough decisions, it weren't easy decisions, tough decisions. In the midst of the toughness, I found a whole lot of comfort because that's what Jesus does for people that believe in him. Even through the hardest of times, he can bring us comfort. And he kind of says as much, he'll, he'll continue and say, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to go. I'm going to be gone for a little bit, but don't worry. For those that have put faith in me on, in this life, I'm coming back for you, and I'm bringing you with me. So the hardships of this life, no matter the hardship that we face in, in the midst of this life, this world, here's where the Christian who believes in Jesus has hope. This is temporary. So in the midst of hardship, we can find comfort in the temporary nature of this life that we get to spend eternity with Jesus. And heaven is going to be awesome because Jesus is there. And Jesus says, I'm bringing you with me. I want you with me. The disciples, they have some questions. They continue asking. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do, not know, you do know him and have seen him. He makes it so crystal clear. We can, we can look at the Bible and we can think different things about it. There are certain things that theologians and Bible nerds will, will argue till they're blue in the face. But the things Jesus wants to make crystal clear, he makes crystal clear. And so he says, when you're thinking about heaven, when you want to know the way to heaven, here's what I'm going to make crystal clear. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. That if you put faith in me, I'm coming back and I'm bringing you with me. I'm the way to God. If you want to see God, if you want to know God, you don't need some, you just need to look no further than Jesus Christ himself because I and the Father are one. If you want to know God, know Jesus. You cannot know God without knowing Jesus. It is absolutely impossible because they are inseparable. Three in one. I'm the truth. You can trust what I'm saying. You can trust how the Old Testament, the prophecies, I am fulfilling them in this very moment. And I'm the life. I'm going to conquer the grave, and I'm going to give you life. So to know me is to know the Father. Do we, do we write it off because, do we write it off, and do we find it to be an, an uncomfortable thought process simply because it's not how we would draw it up? Like, if we were playing God, we might do it a little bit differently. Like, if I'm playing God, here's, here's what human nature would say. Work really, really hard and earn a paycheck. Work really, really hard and don't get a demotion at the end of the year. You get a promotion. Put the time in, you get, you get an end result. Human nature is not typically do something and get something for free. Or do nothing and get something for free, that is. Jesus says, stop doing. I've done it. We can find comfort in that. Every other religion in the world says, do do, 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 and then earn. That's what make Christi makes Christianity so remarkably, thankfully different. Stop trying and rest. And then let me live my life through you. And you can find comfort in that. I, Carl Barth at, at, at a Princeton seminary I was asked this question by a student. A student said, sir, don't you think God has revealed himself in other religions and not only in Christianity? And his answer just blew me away when I read it this week. His answer to the student was, no, God has not revealed himself in any religion, including Christianity. He has revealed himself in the Son. So stop looking for religious titles and look no further than Jesus, because if you find Jesus, you find God. <laughs> and who said, I am the way alone? I alone am the truth. I alone am the life. Peter, who would later on, uh, who would see, who would enter into this tomb, he would, he would be in there, he would see, he would actually be inside of the empty tomb and see that it was empty. He would have breakfast with Jesus on a beach. He, he would see Jesus in his resurrected state, that he was dead, but now he's alive. And then, and then he, Jesus would ascend up into heaven. And if you turn a few pages in your Bible, you'll get to the book of Acts. 
And Peter says this in the book of Acts, that this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Muhammad and I have the same issue, sin. Gandhi and I have the same issue, sin. These other religious leaders, you take Buddha, same issue, sin. Jesus alone lived perfectly. So he alone can be that sacrifice. He's the only one that can take us to the Father. Are we going to write it off as arrogant? I, I Googled this week uh, roadmaps in the United States. Got this picture. Nothing. Google doesn't lie, so this is absolutely true. And, uh, and so what, if I am driving and I'm asking directions maybe to California, and, uh, or maybe, maybe I'm heading to the, the Super Bowl, to, to Minnesota, Tell you guys my pick, but you know it. And uh, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in New England. If I want to get there, the Eagles fans in the room are going to say, stay on 95. <laughs> Keep going on 95. You'll eventually get there. All roads lead to Minnesota. You'll get there. Don't worry. But my friends that actually love me are going to say, it looks like you should jump on 90. 80 will get you in that general direction. If you're going to L.A., let's take 40. Is it really that arrogant to say that there is one way someplace? Or is it actually loving when someone's looking for directions to tell them exactly where to go and not leave it as some ambiguous thing? If I were to die... And I'm, I'm, I'm in, my, in my hospital room. I, I'm on my deathbed of sorts. I, you guys, most of you know Wheels. Wheels is a good, good friend of mine. We have done life together. He's somebody that I would permit and allow to, to be in that moment with me. And I would look at him and I would say, you take care of my kids. And I trust that he would. Because we have that friendship and that love, that brotherly love for one another. Now, fast forward a few years, my daughter is never moving out of the house. She will always live in my house, but let's pretend she's going to college. And, and she goes to Papa Wheelie and says, Papa Wheelie, how do I get to California? Papa Wheelie would not be a very loving person if he's like, jump on 95, you'll get there eventually. Reagan, just start driving. You'll end up, you'll end up at college, trust me. What would I want of wheels? I would want wheels to tell her very specific. In fact, I want wheels to get in the stinking car and never leave the parking lot. <laughs> it's so loving to tell somebody exactly where to go and how to get there. If you, me again, I, for me, I was mainly D's get degrees type of guy in college. I am not, wasn't ever that astute until it mattered. And, uh, and so, but in my earlier days, I wouldn't actually even really read the syllabi or syllabus, however you pronounce it. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily read it. <laughs> I would look at it for like the exact minimum I would have to do. But let's say you actually care about your grades. Would you really want to sit in a professor's class that would give you a syllabi that's one page long and just says, do really hard, do work really hard, and at the end we'll see what grades you get. Like you, if you care about your grades, you're going straight to the dean because you want a very specific list, a very specific how-to in order to get the desired result. And a good professor, a kind person, is going to tell you exactly what you needed to do. And so Jesus, in his love for humanity, says there is no single road to me. It's not all roads. There are no roads. And so out of my love for you, I am going to provide at least one road. One and only road. And it's through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to make that crystal clear because I love you. But again, if we think about our human nature, why on earth do we get to a point where, where we say an exclusive God, an exclusive pathway is so unloving? Uh, when, I, when I think, my wife was coughing, I think she went to get some water, uh, I hope. <laughs> anyway, so uh, when I think about my loving wife, 
society doesn't say, well, Jason, you're such a cosmic buzzkill to say that that is, how stupid that that should be exclusive. Like, imagine if I left here and found my wife and said, hey, I know this is an exclusive thing now, but can we, can we make it a little, like, not so exclusive? She's kicking me. It's going to hurt. Because in a relationship, in an important relationship, exclusivity is, is acceptable. It's loving. To, to look at my wife and say, I don't want to be exclusive, that shows I don't really love her. And so why on earth would the highest relationship mankind could know, mankind and a holy God, why do we pass it off as arrogant when he wants an exclusive relationship with us, open to all people? So they're still confused because they're humans like you and I, and so they go on and, and they ask these questions, show us the Father. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. See, these disciples, they, they, want, they want physical proof. Like, God, like, give, me, give me something tangible. Give me something that I can, I can wrap my mind around and I can touch and, and whatnot. And sometimes we, we look for that same type of tangible evidence. And Jesus is saying, I am the evidence. You don't need to look any further but me. Here I am. The Father and I are one. We, we would think falsely that if, if God would only speak to me audibly, if God came, came in and spoke to me and I heard his audible voice say, say it's Jesus, Jesus is the only way, then I, then I would believe. Are there any parents or anybody that has ever worked with a teenager or a child in the room? Sometimes we say things audibly and it gets completely misconstrued, does it not? Sometimes you say something to your son Landon and then he does this thing, and you're wondering, how did you take what I just said and do that? It makes no sense. And so the things that we want to make crystal clear, we put in writing. And so God, out of his love for us, gave us this holy, inerrant word, which makes it crystal clear. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. You know Jesus, then you know the Father, because I am in him and he is in me. We are one. And so if we look at Jesus as the Son of God, how on earth could we write him off as just a good person? Every other faith group, many other faith groups, look at Jesus as a really good, important person, a prophet. How can that be? Be. We've read some of the things he said. How could that be? Because what good person is simultaneously also a liar? What person would you say is the world's biggest liar, but you're also going to say, well, he's a pretty good person as well? We can't write Jesus off as a good person and also see him as an incredible liar. And then the other option is if we... Look at Jesus, this is C.S. Lewis's argument that, that he, he claimed to be the Son of God. We're looking at passages like that. Now, I have a good friendship with Josh. If Josh came to me and says, Jason, I, I actually think I'm God. I, I think I'm God in the flesh. My first thought is he is a lunatic. There's lunacy behind that. If any one of you came up to me and said, I am God. Part of you is a lunatic, and that's C.S. Lewis's argument. If you're gonna if you're gonna look at Jesus as a good person, then then if you look at his words, then he's either a liar or he's a lunatic. Or there's a third, very powerful option. He's actually Lord. If you were to look at his words, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or just perhaps he might be Lord. He makes it clear through his words. So in that, again, do we pass it off as, as arrogant? When I Googled arrogant, this is what came up. Having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. If we even have a rudimentary understanding of God, 
even if we're not, if we're, even if we're going to ignore Jesus for a second, if we just have some grasp of God as a figure, how on earth could we take that definition and say God is arrogant? If God, who is massive and beyond our understanding, if he's, we talked about transcendent in the past, like God is way above us, then we have to look at that definition and we would have to say God can never be exaggerated. He is so beyond us. It is impossible to exaggerate his importance or his abilities because by definition, that has to be true of God. And it would be arrogant of us to think that we are God by that definition. And so my God isn't arrogant. Even the people that don't say that he's Lord but see him as a good person, none of them I've ever heard would say that he's an arrogant person. Why? They look at him and say he's good and he's loving. So I want to speak truth to people, but I know if I start the conversation with, well, here's why you suck, and here's Jesus, <laughs> then arrogance is going to exude. So yesterday, we loved people. We went out to 12, uh, 12 laundromats, gave out about $800 worth of quarters. It was awesome. <laughs> no one... Uh, no one walked up to me yesterday and said, thanks for the quarter, you arrogant son of a gun. <laughs> and here's what we didn't do. We didn't start off the conversation by saying, what team are you rooting for this coming Sunday? <laughs> we didn't start off by saying, who do you go to bed with at night? What's your biggest, darkest se secret? We just loved them. Hand the card that said, God loves you and so do we. And that opened the door to many conversations. Graham had, was in one where he told somebody clearly, Jesus is the only way to God. But it started with an act of love, which breaks down the walls of arrogance. And so our big thought for, for this morning is that Jesus is our comfort. That in the midst of life's discomfort, in the, in the midst of the chaos of life, in the midst of thinking about the afterlife, that Jesus is our comfort. He's different than every other religion. No matter what ism you ascribe to, Mormonism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, in, 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 in Mormonism, they probably do more missional work than most churches do. If you, want, if you want to take Buddhism or Hinduism, they probably worship more than most churches worship, sometimes days at a time. Islam prays more than many of us do. So at some point, we have to look at them as different because they're all saying, keep doing, keep doing, keep doing, and find comfort in, in doing. Find comfort that the weight of eternity rests right on your shoulders. I don't find that to be comforting. Jesus is different because I say, he says, I did it. It's done. Trust me and allow me to live my life through you. And that there is our comfort. That when I think about my long-term security, it's secure in Jesus. I don't need to think about eternity and, and try to change truth or redefine truth to, to better fit my lifestyle, my thinking. That I can look at Jesus as truth and find comfort in the fact that it is finished. And where there was no way, Jesus is the way. It's an open road to everybody. It's one singular way that's open to everybody. It's all inclusive. That's why our, one of our core values is the gospel is for everyone. Can you think of a sin Jesus didn't die for that we can't, that we value an all-inclusive gospel message? What would be arrogant is if Jesus said, here's the singular road, it's only for the rich people. Here's a singular road. It's only for people that have never been in prison. It's only for people that have never done X, Y, Z. It's only for this. It's only for that. No, it's a road that's open to everybody where there was. It's not many roads. It's one road, but it's open to all. And therefore, I'm going to make it crystal clear for you because I love you. And so we, too, believe in an all-inclusive gospel message that Jesus is for absolutely everyone. So, church, what are we going to do about this? If we take this seriously, I, I want to encourage us to continue praying for one. I want to, this is a, a, a book that, that meant a lot to us when we were starting this church. You'll see that the volunteer shirts have won. My, my uh, email address is jason at wellspring dot one. Unless you have a complaint, then it's ava at wellspring uh, dot one. And, and uh, the website is wellspring.one because we are focused on being relent in relentless pursuit of one. 
is a parable where Jesus leaves the 99 to go after the one lost person, and that when he finds that one lost person, he celebrates. And so we want to be in relentless pursuit of people because they need Jesus. It's open for everybody. And so I want to wake up every day praying for the opportunity to share God's love, whether it's anybody or there's a few people that I'm praying for by name. God, give me an opportunity. I want to share with them your love. So church, will we take that seriously? When we think back on 2017, if we never shared the gospel with one single person, do we take this seriously? Is this really a matter of life and death? The most loving thing you can do is to share with somebody truth. You might think it's loving to keep your mouth shut and not, and not make something uncomfortable over somebody on this life. But when your friend is spending eternity apart from God, feeling the wrath of God, they would look over to you and say, you are the most unloving person in the world. You never spoke up. The most loving thing you can do is to speak up. So church, will we take this seriously? Jim Collins writes this book called uh, How the Mighty Fall. I love reading. Well, I listen to business books. I'm an audio book kind of guy. And uh, so I listened to this book by Jim Collins, How the Mighty Fall. He looks at companies and, uh, and how it, they went from very successful companies to how they eventually went bankrupt and plummeted or had to be bought out by somebody else, yada, yada, yada. And so he, he, he illustrates, as he, he does a whole bunch of studies with that. He says that there's five steps to leading to decline. And, and the reason I bring this up is because I think it's so indicative of how you and I also live our lives. And so he says the first, the first stage, uh, stage one, is a hubris born in, in success, that, we are so, that we've been so successful that we take pride in that and that we can't possibly be wrong. And so he brings up Motorola. Motorola and the Kia, they used to be fighting for the, the, uh, the cell phone market. Anybody still got a Motorola phone or a Nokia snake phone? They died out mostly because, because Motorola had, had, a, had a monopoly on the analog market. Any of all your cell phones running in analog? Not so much. When Motorola came to the decision between going from analog to digital, they said in an article, we have 46 or 36 million analog customers who can't be wrong. And they went all in on analog. And that's why we have the world's greatest phones in Apple. And so, uh, but I think we do that sometimes. We've been so successful as a person that I can't be wrong. So then he goes to stage two. He says, an, an undisciplined pursuit of more. He'll, he'll bring out Rubbermaid. Rubbermaid wanted to be innovative. And so what they did is they said, we, in our quest to be innovation, uh, innovative, and we've been so successful that here's what we want to do. We want to keep going. And so we're going to create a new product every single day. They had it as their goal to create 365 new products every single year. They were ascribing and wanting more and more and more, searching for more and more and more, and it eventually led to their buyout. Humankind, aren't we seeking more and more and more sometimes to our downfall. He says stage three is, is a denial of risk and peril. When we see things starting to turn and we all of a sudden we, we focus on the good, to, to ignore the bad, that I look at the news and that guy, that disgusting dude in, in, in Michigan that did all those things to those gymnasts, well, I'm not that guy, so it's easy for me to look at my little bad and say it's not that bad. We, we start denying the bad in our own lives, and a company that does that will eventually lead to stage four where he calls grasping for success, that when, you're, when, when the end is around the corner, what you start doing is you start researching and you, and you start you trying to find that silver bullet. I just need something to find salvation. I need to, I need to end all this. And so you do your research. You try to find that silver bullet. You try to put all your chips into one basket and hope that it's right. And Jim Collins says in his book that bad decisions made with good intentions are still bad decisions. That despite all the research, if you make the wrong decision, it leads to stage five in your company's death. Don't we get to a point in our own humanity where even with the best of intentions, we make what will become the worst decision that we can make? Sometimes intentions won't do it. I can, in a very well-meaning way, be wrong. So in John 3, the scene before the, the verse that we looked at at the beginning, 
Jesus is talking with this na- man named Nicodemus who, who is inquisitive, wants to know more about Jesus. They have this conversation. He was a very intellectual man, and, and, he, and he says this to, to Jesus, or this, this is how the conversation goes. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Talking about how we have to be born of the Spirit and, and not just born of, of a woman. And Jesus says, he answered him, you are a teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. For if, if I had told you earthly things and you did not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then here's that bold statement. Whoever believes in him, the Son of God, may have eternal life. So he talks about Moses, and he he says the scene when Moses is is with Israel, and they have this sickness as is going through the Israeli camp. And and in the conversation with God, God God says, well, lift up the serpent and tell the people if, if they look at the serpent and believe that they will be saved, they will be saved. And so Moses takes that conversation, goes and tells the people, and some of them take Moses, ideally God at his word, and they look at the serpent, they believe, and they are saved from their sickness, but some would ignore it, and that day that they would die. How loving would it have been for Moses to hear from God and say nothing? God, that's really arrogant. No, the most loving thing Moses could have done, he did. He told the people, here's exactly what you need to do to live. Some lived. Some ignored. And so in the most loving way I can say it, Jesus is the only way to God. Apart from him, there is no hope. It's not arrogant. It's out of love for you that I express that. So my hope for us today is that those that came in here thinking that all roads lead to to heaven, some of that means that the weight of eternity is resting on your shoulders. And every day, was I good enough? Was I good enough? Did, Did God turn a blind eye when the cop turned a blind eye? I don't know here now and you still have a choice to make today. My prayer is that you would look and believe. Let me pray. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the people that fill this room. And Father, I pray that we would wrestle as the disciples took their their discomfort to you. Father, I pray that in this moment we are taking our discomfort to you, whether that is whatever's going on in life or whether it is possibly even the thoughts of eternity, Father, that we would take it to you and come to a place of trust. Jesus, today I pray that some would choose to take you at your word and take you as Lord. And if they do, if they're in that moment where they're ready to say, God, you are the only way, I pray that they would say something along these lines to you right now in this moment. Jesus, I am sorry. Whether or not I've been caught in the past, Father, I am sorry for the sins that I have committed. I have been wrong. I don't take that lightly because I understand now that that my wrong put your son on a cross. Father, I thank you for giving me life. Life in your son. I thank you for raising him from the grave. For providing me a way where there literally was no other way. Father, I thank you. And I choose to to let you live your life through me and become more and more like your son on a daily basis. I love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. If you prayed that, it, we, we take to heart what Revelation talks about, that when somebody turns to Jesus, that, that they erupt in a party that they worship. And so on your way out, we'd love to get you a Bible and talk more about what a relationship with Jesus means. But I'm assuming, I'm hopeful, it's the right assumption that some people said yes to relationship with Jesus and that the angels are partying and worshiping. So we want to close it by joining them in worshiping and partying as well. Let's sing.